All right, everybody, 10 o'clock, bringing in the online world. Welcome back to your favorite class. Yes, I got a dank new meme for you, the Velociraptor, the distance raptor divided by the time raptor, which I don't know what a distance raptor looks like. I don't know what a time raptor looks like, but I bet they're pretty awesome. All right, a uh, couple of announcements. Homework unbuckling was due right now, so hopefully you got that in. Um, please do so in the next couple of minutes if you haven't. Going to get another homework soon on strain transformations, what we're talking about right now. Uh, so look for that probably coming out later today. Reminder, uh, for those of you that have lab on Thursday, uh, we're not actually meeting formally, uh, but you do need to get your buckling lab in at 10 o'clock at the beginning of the lab section tomorrow. So please do that. Um, I will be there in the meeting if you have questions about, I don't know, random stuff. Um, but since we don't really have any outstanding homework right now, um, maybe not going to have a lot of people there, but I will be there. OK, if you want to talk about stuff. <clears throat> OK, so that's that. Let's pick up then where we left off. Uh, which was working through an example problem, and we had kind of made our way a little bit through it, and I'll bring up where we kind of were. All right. So here we were with this example problem, uh, and we were looking at strain transformations for this particular element. So we have this like element here that was in the XY coordinate system, and we're told that, what was that? All right, in this XY coordinate system, and we're told that it had some um, strains in this coordinate system that were kind of given. All right, maybe these strains are measured by, let's say, a strain rosette that you placed on the surface of the material, just like you might have done for your combined loading lab. So we have these strains in this XY coordinate system, and we want to determine, all right, what are the strains in this rotated coordinate system, which is like this NT coordinate system? So we're going to use strain transformation equations for that, which I sort of went over last time. But first, I wanted to draw what the deform element might look like in the XY coordinate system. And I sort of did my best job to sort of take what was in the XY coordinate system and look at what it might look like uh, after the deformation that was sort of given this 800 and X, negative 1000 and Y, and then negative 600 XY strain. So that's what it kind of looks like in the deformed condition in XY. I did my best. Again, I'm not the best artist, but did my best. But now uh, to sort of cap off the problem, we're going to do strain transformations to see what this would look like in the deformed condition in the NT coordinate system. So let's transform and rotate to NT coordinate system. All right. So given strains in X, Y coordinate system, and we know the rotation angle between the X, Y and the N, T axes. We can just use our strain equations directly. So here that's going to be uh, strain transformation equations. And so to remind you what those might look like, I'll use the double angle here. Just keep it spicy, change things up. This is going to be epsilon x plus epsilon y on 2 plus epsilon x minus epsilon y on 2 times cosine 2 theta. All right, plus gamma xy on 2. Don't forget your factor of 2. This is how it differs from the stress transformation equations times sine 2 theta. All right, these are our strain transformation equations. Now, the question is, what is the value of theta? It's kind of the only unknown outstanding variable that we don't quite have yet. And just to remind ourselves what the coordinate system that we're looking like is working with here, we start with x, y. And we're moving to a coordinate system that is the NT coordinate system, which is like this guy here. Kind of given in the problem. And we're told that this angle here is 30 degrees. So what is the appropriate choice for the value of theta for this problem? Someone in the audience. Negative 30 degrees, thank you. Got a lot of you guys on the test, okay? Because the NT axis is 30 degrees clockwise from XY, we have to use a negative 30 degrees here. Since we sort of had to move generally in this direction, that's a negative value of theta, right? So here's the value of theta, negative 30 degrees. So we're good to go now to calculate what the strain is in the n direction using this transformation equation. 
And so here I'll work in microstrain. I'm not going to write the units, um, but you get the idea. I'm working in microstrain. This is going to be, geez, 800 minus 1,000. Too much coffee this morning. I'm shaky. Over two plus 800 plus 1,000. Since epsilon y is negative, over two times cosine of negative 60. This is going to be plus gamma xy, which is negative 600. Negative 600 on 2 times sine negative 60. All right. So you punch all this in on your calculator. You'll get a strain in the n direction, which is 610 microstrain. All right, can go through a similar process in the t direction and for gamma and t, so let's do that. Remember our equation for strain in the t direction? Looks very similar to that in the n, except some negative signs pop in. So here this is epsilon x plus epsilon y on two. Here now minus epsilon x minus epsilon y. On two multiplied by cosine two theta minus gamma xy on two times sine two theta. That's our general equation for the strain in the t direction. I'm not going to rewrite this with numbers in there. You can, you know, punch those in on your own time. But here we'll find that the strain in the t direction is going to be negative 810 microstrain. And finally, we'll work through gamma nt. So this is the strain, the shear strain in the nt coordinate system. Equation here, negative epsilon x minus epsilon y times uh, sine two theta. Here this is plus gamma xy cosine two theta. It's your general strain transformation equation. Again, we have all these values. You could just punch them in and, and work your calculator magic. You'll find here the gamma NT, 1260 microstrain. All right. So what does this now look like in the deformed condition for the NT coordinate system? All right, so to summarize here, if we wanted to write our strains in sort of like a matrix form, which might be helpful. Six, 10, negative eight, 10, and 12, 60. What does this look like in this NT coordinate system? So I'll sort of draw the NT coordinate system and sort of like this off axis configuration just because that's sort of how it was sort of given to us in the problem here's n t coordinate system my original undeformed element in nt would just kind of look like a square so let's try to do our best to sort of make a square here and say that this is undeformed <clears throat> okay and then i have some extension in n i have some compression in t and then I have a strong positive shear and T. Remember, positive shear is a sort of a sort of a pinching here um, with the angle sort of causing a shrinking near the near the origin of the element. OK, so I'm going to keep those things in mind when I when I draw this. So I have sort of like a, a an angle that is kind of working itself, working in on itself. 
So maybe my shear strain angle looks something like this. I have a question, it looks like. Does theta change at all in the equations, or all, is it always negative 30? Yeah, theta will change depending on how you're rotating. So currently, we're moving from an xy coordinate system to an nt coordinate system, where the nt coordinate system is oriented negative 30 degrees with xy. That was given in the problem, Caleb. All right. So I'm gonna sh I'm gonna be shrinking in t. I'm gonna be expanding in n. So that might look I don't know something like I'll do my best here. Shrinking in t, expanding in n might look something like this. Okay, highly exaggerated. So we see I've kind of like shrunk in T, kind of like expanded in N. And I have a positive shear strain, which is sort of this angle here, all together would give me like a positive 1260 shear strain component. Okay? Because I have what is like a positive over a positive component here. All right, so this would be like the deformed condition here. And some of those strains highly exaggerated. OK, this is not to scale. I'm just kind of doing my best. All right. OK, so that's strain transformations. You actually did some of this, a little bit of this with your combined loading lab, even though you didn't maybe necessarily know that you were doing it. <laughs> when you're transforming strains from the axis of the strain gauge rosette to the axis generally of the combined loading apparatus, you actually sort of did this already. Without even knowing it, you're a poet and you didn't know it. Okay. All right, so the next topic we have for strain transformations is principal strains. So let's move on principal strains here. OK, and it's like very similar to principal stresses. For principal stresses, you have an element and you can rotate it into some configuration that has no shear stress. That would be a principal stress direction. There's the same idea here is that you can rotate an element into some orientation that gives you no shear strain and gives you maximum strain axial strains. OK, so similar to principal stress. Um, there's also some critical rotation angle that will give you maximum normal strains. and no shear strain. OK. <clears throat> we would find this by sort of taking the derivative of the strain transformation equation with respect to theta, just like we did for the stresses, setting that equal to 0 and determining what value of theta would afford us that general direction. So to find. We take the derivative of this epsilon n equation, which is a function of theta with respect to theta, and set it equal to zero, just like we sort of did for the principal stress calculations. This would give the principal rotation angle, which we in the past have called theta p.
OK, and then. Theta P back. Into epsilon N. Equation, your strain transformation equation. Gives principal strains. Which we'll typically label as epsilon one, epsilon two, and epsilon three. Just like you have sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. All right, principal stresses. Here we have principal strains. <clears throat> OK, I'm not going to go through that whole derivation. We sort of did that derivation for the principal stresses. It's very similar here for principal strains. I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase and you'll see that the equations for principal strains are very similar to those for principal stresses, except that weird floating factor of two that I kind of warned you about um, that we've seen in the strain transformation equations. So um, skipping the derivation here. So. for in-plane principal strains. You have the following. Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2. This is going to look very similar to your principal stress calculations. This is Epsilon X plus Epsilon Y on 2 plus or minus the square root here of epsilon x minus epsilon y on 2 squared plus don't forget your factor of 2 here gamma xy on 2 squared <clears throat> like i said it's looking a lot like the principal stress transformations or the principal stress equations except that silly pesky floating factor of two all right so here's your equation for in plane principal strains okay your rotation angle to get you to those principal conditions. Again, look very similar to what you see for stress transformations. This is uh, one half the inverse tangent of gamma xy over epsilon x minus epsilon y. OK, so that's your principal strains. You could also do um, a maximum like in plane shear strain. So this is very similar to like a maximum shear stress. Similar process. What I'll call the maximum in plane shear strain gamma max. The process here would be. Take. The derivative of gamma and T. As a function of theta with respect to theta. This is going to give you. That it equal to zero. This will give you the rotation angle theta. which gets you into <clears throat> a configuration of maximum shear, this theta gamma. And theta gamma back into 
this equation for gamma nt to get gamma max. Hopefully we're sort of following that. <clears throat> Again, very similar to what we did for maximum shear stress, except here now we're doing it for the strains. So after doing all that, you'll come up with the following. Gamma max. Here's equal to pesky floating factor of two. Times the square root of all of this stuff. All right. And you can also find this rotation angle that gets you into configuration of maximum shear strain. That's going to be one half tangent inverse of epsilon y minus epsilon x divided by gamma xy. So let's put this stuff to use and actually do an example problem. More example problems. Rawr. Give you a second for anyone still sort of writing this down. OK. Let's work through an example problem here. We have strain components at a point in a body under a state of plane strain. Oh man, I'm complicated. What does it mean to be in a state of plane strain? Someone tell me. What should immediately jump to your head when you hear plane strain? What is epsilon z? Zero, right? So that's what you should think of here. So the strain in the z direction is zero. What about the stress in the z direction? Zero or not zero? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the, no, I'm just kidding. Not zero? Not zero, good. You can kind of think of it as you have one or the other. In plane strain, epsilon z is zero, sigma z is not zero. In plane stress, sigma z is zero, Epsilon Z, not zero. Complicated, but not really. All right, so we got these strain components, maybe from some internal strain gauge inside this piece. Determine the principal strains and maximum shear strain at the point. We want to sketch the elements in the rotated conditions. All right, it's kind of a cool problem. OK, I'll just copy over kind of the relevant information here and we'll go to business. It's business time. Flight of the Concords, anybody know that reference? It's business time. OK. Maybe I'm just old and you guys don't know that one. It's probably more likely the situation. OK, so given plane strain, so this is the symbol for plane strain, which means that your out of plane strain is zero, with the following.
These are strain readings that might come from some strain gauge rosette. 1200, negative 600, and 900. Micro strain. <clears throat> we want to find principal stresses in plane, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and the maximum shear strain. OK, baby. Let's dance. So we'll use principal strain equations. And so that's just going to be epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 is the following epsilon x plus epsilon y on 2 plus or minus the square root here of epsilon x minus epsilon y on 2 squared plus gamma xy on 2 squared. So here, this is 1200 minus 600 on two, plus or minus the square root of all of this stuff. This is 1200 plus 600 on two, squared plus <coughs> gamma xy in this problem is 900. So 900 divided by 2 squared. And so here this will be 300 plus or minus 1006. Micro strain. Or if we sort of just punch these in and work this out, epsilon one here will be 1306. Micro strain, epsilon two, your other principal strain, negative 706. Micro strain. What is my third principal strain? Zero. How do you know that? Right, it's out of plane. And what conditions am I in? Plane strain. Make me nervous. All righty. You could reorder them from greatest to least, kind of by convention. But there you go. All right, so those are your principal strains. Now the maximum shear stress or the maximum shear strain. That's two times all this nonsense. Don't forget the dang two. So many people forget the dang two. Don't forget the two. We sort of already did this calculation. This here is this. Hopefully we sort of see that. But don't forget the two. Oh my God. So then your max shear strain is two times 1006 which is 2012 microstrain, the year I was born. Okay. 
I'm like Jack. You guys ever see that movie? It's Robin Williams. He ages like four times faster than normal. That's a oh man, that's such a good Robin Williams movie. It's from like the mid '90s. It's just classic, terrible movie. If I was born in 12 and 2012, that would make me eight. But if I age four times faster, it'd make me appear 32, which is about right. There you go. OK, so there we go with our principal uh, strains and our maximum shear strain in plane. Um, but we also might want the rotation angles that get us to that position. That's going to help us with our sketch. So we need. The rotation angles to get us into principal coordinates, so that might be theta P. We also need. Theta gamma, which is getting us the rotation angle that gets us to a condition of maximum shear strain. Those are not the same equations. <clears throat> OK, so. For theta P, we have the following. It's one half the inverse tangent of uh, gamma xy over epsilon x minus epsilon y. Which is one half inverse tangent of 900 over 1200 plus 600. And remember, the tangent function has um, two solutions on the domain 0 to 360. So because we have that 1 half here, we have two solutions on 0 to 180. <clears throat> so here, this is 13.3 degrees. Or 103.3 degrees. I wish it was 103.3 degrees. No, that's a little too hot for me. 13.3 is a little cold. Would you guys rather have 13.3 or 103.3? 103, he likes 103. I like neither. <laughs> I think us Wisconsinites do better here, but you know, to each their own. Similar process for theta gamma. This is one half tangent inverse <coughs> of what would be epsilon y minus epsilon x over gamma xy. You can plug all these in. You're going to get two solutions here again. Negative 31.7 degrees. Definitely not definitely not what I want. And 58.3 degrees. That sounds better. Notice these are displaced 45 degrees from your theta p values. That's not circumstantial. That's, you know, going to happen every time. So what are these angles that we just calculated? What do they physically mean? Well, it's going to help us to sort of physically understand what they are if we make some sketches. So some sketches here. And first, let's do a sketch in principal coordinates. Let's do. And for this, we'll take a rotation angle here, which will do uh, the 13.3 condition. So what does this like mean physically? All right, well, we have some element in XY. And we are told about some things going on with this element in X, Y, but we will, what we want to do is draw in some new coordinate system that's 13.3 degrees rotated from this. So that's something that looks like this. 
Where that angle there is about 13 degrees. Here's N, here's T. This here is 13.3 degrees, the temperature of my cold heart. And so on the NT axis, we have, let's say, like an undeformed orientation of just like the standard square. But when we deform, we're going to have strains in the N and T direction, which are principal strains. OK, so here that's going to be our um, 1306 and negative 706. And what's my shear strain in this new NT coordinate system? Zero. We're rotating to a coordinate system that has no shear. So this is like your deformed case. So we can draw this, all right? I'm contracting in T, I'm expanding in N, and I have no shear. I'm contracting in T, I'm expanding in N, and I have no shear. So here's your deformed condition. So rotating to a coordinate system and you know that just has principal strains, you're not going to have any shear. So it's kind of easy to sketch that and draw that. All right. So let's rotate now to a coordinate system with maximum shear strain. And let's take theta gamma equal to, I don't know, let's do the 53.3 case. Sorry, 58.3. Is it 58? Yeah, 58.3. Okay, so here would be like the xy where we started. And now we want to look at how this thing is deforming at this, you know, 58.3. Okay, maybe that's here. It's going to be a fun one to draw. Good luck. Who knows what movie that's from? Good luck. Scott Liam Neeson. He listens to it like 5,000 times in the movie. Who's got it in the chat? Come on. Rhymes with bacon. Taken. You guys ever see that movie with Liam Neeson? Oh. Man, you guys are depraved. All right, so here, let's just draw our gamma max which we know in this uh, particular system is going to be 2012 microstrain. And so a positive value of the shear strain is going to cause the edges to sort of pinch in in this coordinate system. So here we might have something that looks like, boy, I'm going to do my best here. This. All right, right here, this is, oh geez. Reminder, this is. All right, questions? A lot of stuff going on there. Principal strains. Similar to principal stress, you know, but at least now we get to sort of draw some deformed geometry when we're talking about strains. All right. Okay. 
Cool. Last thing I want to do is just breeze through the strain rosette notes. And I've already sort of presented this in sort of combined loading lab number one. But I just want to show them again, and I'm just going to voice over the PowerPoints because we sort of already talked about this stuff. And I just want to kind of go over it quickly. Why did that not come up? Okay, here. Okay, so we sort of like talked about this, and the last thing I want to talk about for the strain transformations is sort of reinforce strain gauge rosettes, how they work, why they're useful, etc. So remember for these strain gauge rosettes, we sort of already seen these notes or these strain gauges that go on the surface. How they work is you've got some electrical wire that's contained in some um, non-conductive, you know, plastic, usually a Kapton film. And you're going to sort of measure the resistance of this particular wire inside of this uh, insulated housing. All right, and we know the resistance of this wire is governed by just general physics of the wire itself, the resistivity of the material row, the total length of the wire inside the gauge L, and the cross-sectional area of the wire, which is usually quite small, is capital A. So we saw that if the gauge gets longer, you're going to have a smaller cross-section by Poisson effect. You're going to have a longer wire, both of those things adding to increase the resistance of the gauge. If you're in compression, you're going to have a shorter wire, obviously, and you're going to expand your cross-section by Poisson effect. Both of those things would decrease the resistance of the wire. And so what happens is, you know, the manufacturer will calibrate these gauges and come up with a gauge factor that tells you, all right, what is the change of resistance divided by the initial resistance of the gauge per strain that we apply to the piece? So whenever you buy a strain gauge, like I sort of mentioned in the combined loading lab, it comes with a gauge factor. I think for you guys, your general gauge factors in all your labs is like 2.11 or something like that. So that just gives you a calibration of how much strain do I get per change in resistance of the gauge? And this is very specific to each gauge that you buy. So each gauge is going to have a different value. The manufacturer needs to tell you what that is. And so when you buy a strain gauge, they tell you the gauge factor is blah, all right? We've also talked about strain rosettes. Specifically, we've looked at the strain, uh, the 45 degree strain rosette. And we've used this a couple of times now to calculate what the shear strain is on a piece, as well as the strain in various directions. So for instance, when you have this 45 degree rosette, this gauge will obviously measure the strain in the X direction. This gauge will obviously measure the strain in the Y direction. This gauge is not the shear strain reading. Oh my God. This is not the shear strain, this gauge, okay? The shear strain is calculated using the strain of this particular gauge, and it has this equation here. That this, the shear strain on the surface in this location would be two times this sort of like 45 degree gauge minus the additive X and Y gauges. So when you're calculating shear strain, got to make sure you're doing it appropriately. That's specific for a 45 degree rosette. However, if you have three gauges at a point that are none of the gauges are redundant, obviously like one's not lined up on top of each other, that would be silly. If you have three individual gauges at a point, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, defined by angles relative to some reference axis, theta one, theta two, and theta three, then you can calculate what the strains are in the one, sorry, the X, Y, and gamma X, Y, using this set of linear equations. And this is sort of derived in your book. I didn't really feel that the derivation was all that critical here. It's actually quite a long derivation. But if you have the readings of gauge one, two, and three, which would be like gauge one, gauge two, and gauge three, then you could solve this set of linear equations to determine epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy, which would be like the strains in the X, there's no Y axis shown here, but you could understand that there would be a Y axis here and the shear strain in this coordinate system. Okay, so this is a general equation to get you strains. All right. I'll give you guys a second, maybe you want to copy this. I would advise copying these equations here. They're in these notes. They're in the lab lecture one notes for combined loading. 
So find them in both places. You'll use this equation on your upcoming homework, so you might want these um, at the ready. The last thing I'll say, I'll, I'll, there's some people still copying, so I'll, I'll wait just a second. Last thing I want to say, typically strain gauges are placed on the surface of a material. OK, if a strain gauge is placed on a surface of material. That particular point of the material is in a state of plane stress. OK, if you're on the surface of a material, the out of plane component of stress is almost always zero. So when you place a strain gauge on the surface of a piece, you are in conditions of plane stress. OK, that means that the stress in the third direction is zero, but the strain is not zero. OK, that's what it means to be in a condition of plane stress. The stress in the third direction is zero. The strain is not zero. And remember that the strain in the third direction can be calculated using this equation, which I talked about when we had that whole lecture on plane stress versus plane strain. So remember, your strain in the third direction is not zero if you're in a condition of plane stress which is most of the time what you're in if you place a gauge on the surface of a piece. Unless you just happen to have some weird circumstance where the strain in X and the strain in Y cancel each other out, which could happen, though not often in practice. OK, the last thing here is an example with kind of three off axis gauges. I was hoping to kind of go through this example today, but just kind of ran out of time. What I'm going to do, I'm going to make a YouTube video of this example and I'll post it and I'll share it with you guys and you can sort of watch it on your own time. OK, so I'll do that, you know, right after this lecture and I'll post that, you know, probably by noon today. Then I'll work on grading your labs and hopefully get those back to you by the end of the day. And then I'll sleep because I'm I'm sleepy. <laughs> OK, so that'll be it for today, and that'll conclude our strain transformation notes. Next time is going to be torsion of non-circular members. I'll post those notes as well. I think there were some people maybe still copying this, so I'll, I'll put this back up as well. That's going to be it for today. Thank you for coming.